The encyclopedia was seemingly an inevitability. With the advent of the written word and the expanse of humanity's knowledge surpassing what anyone could feasibly remember and pass on to later generations, it only made sense some might recognize the importance of preserving the advancements that had been made in science, technology, and agriculture, among others. So it's not surprising that the idea of the encyclopedia was created multiple times across civilizations in centuries. The first of which was the Historia Naturalis, created by Pliny the Elder of Rome. The book, which its Latin name is literally translated as Natural History, is somewhat controversially known as the first encyclopedia because of its inclusion of its author's own opinions, biases, and errors throughout. But it largely was the best collection of ancient knowledge to come out of its time. In fact, its name, which has widely been translated as Natural History, could also be interpreted as the research of the creation, which more aptly depicts Pliny's goal of exploring every facet of knowledge from the ancient world that he could ascertain best put by his nephew, Pliny the Younger, as a learned and comprehensive work as full of variety as nature itself. This is the story of Pliny the Elder in the first encyclopedia, and this is Learn Something New. This encyclopedia was not something easily compiled, and in fact, was something Pliny the Elder dedicated his life to. From early on in his life, Pliny the Elder had been interested in all variety of subjects as a naturalist, philosopher, writer, high-ranking military commander, and dear friend of Roman Emperor Vespasian, who assumed leadership of Rome after their civil war in 69 AD and worked to rebuild and stabilize their territories. Pliny the Elder came from a wealthy family of the equestrian class in northern Italy, where modern-day Como is. Being born around 23 AD under the name Gaius Plinius Secundus, later to be known as Pliny the Elder after his nephew Pliny the Younger was born. The equestrian class were a higher rank of the Roman Empire's order, typically meaning that they were a municipality's governing class, though members often went into military service. As a teen, Pliny was sent to Rome for education, and while he completed his education there, he would move into military service at the age of 24, doing tours in Germany as a commander, becoming well known for his excellence and integrity. And it would be as a commander he met future Roman Emperor Vespasian. It was also during his military expeditions that he began to write. At first, his writings were just about the utilization of javelins by the cavalry, but would lay the groundwork for a later book, 20 volumes long, about wars in Germany. But once the Roman Emperor Nero died in 68 AD, he returned to Rome, working as a lawyer for a short stint, but in the next year, when Vespasian became emperor, Pliny was quickly appointed as one of his most trusted advisors and served as a governor of one of Rome's imperial provinces before returning to Rome to assist Vespasian's son Titus as he prepared to take over for his father as ruler of Rome. But Pliny was working on a side project at this time, a self-imposed task that would occupy nearly every moment of his free time and also perhaps be one of the primary reasons that he never bothered to marry. After spending his early adulthood reading everything he could get his hands on, he began to take down nearly every fact he could about the world, noting the significance of his work by saying, No Roman author has attempted the same project, nor has any Greek treated all these matters single-handed. The compilation of works would grow with each passing day, eventually becoming the longest single text surviving the Roman world. So what was contained within the many volumes of natural history? Well, since Pliny the Elder intended for the book to be used more as a reference source rather than to be read cover to cover, the first book had a table of contents to instruct the reader where to go to find specific topics discussed, and is actually one of the original examples of a table of contents that we found, though Pliny would say that he found Roman author Quintus Valerius Soranus to have been the first instance of one that he had seen. Which brings us to the other part of the first book, the bibliography. Pliny was known for accusing some of the other writers of his time for copying the words of those who came before them and presenting them as if they had come up with them themselves. He looked down on plagiarism, stating where his sources came from and what they contributed to, though he specified that he had made considerable additions to their information, things which were either not known to his predecessors or which had been lately discovered. The second book of natural history discusses astronomy, leaning heavily on Greek ideas to do so, entertaining ideas about the earth 
Earth being spherical, while also describing the potential for milk and blood to rain from the sky. Books 3 through 6 discuss geography, pulling much of this from Greek works, discussing distant lands and cultures that were often described with mythological significance. Book 7 talks about humans and those who he had read about that were human adjacent, like the mountain dwellers who had dog heads and mankind's bodies, choosing to bark instead of speaking. Once again, a section that intertwined myth with reality. Books 8 through 11 dove into zoology, classifying animals by their size, starting with elephants and ending with insects, basing most of this section off the works of Aristotle. But the largest section of the encyclopedia were books 12 through 27, focusing on botany, the study of plants, where Pliny the Elder discussed everything from medicinal plants to agricultural flora. His focus on medicine continues into books 28 and 29, where he gives his opinion on doctors of the time, for which it was clear he held much contempt, largely skeptical of their abilities to actually heal anyone. And he shares this similar opinion of doctors to the magicians of the time, which he begrudgingly includes in book 30, writing, I have often shown the lies of the magi for what they are. Book 31 talks about the properties of water, and he follows that up in Book 32 with a discussion of animals that live within the water. He then spends Books 33 through 37 talking about minerals, metallurgy, and mining, concluding the encyclopedia with a book about gemstones, though some of his descriptions miss the mark, saying that crystals are formed after being hardened by intense cold. In all, the encyclopedia contained over one million words, making the writing of multiple copies extremely laborious, with scribes spending extreme amounts of time copying more words than were contained within the Bible. But having no wife or children of his own, Pliny the Elder spent a lot of time with his nephew, Pliny the Younger, who would write about how devoted his uncle was to his work, saying that he only took time off work to bathe, but even then, he would often take someone with him to either read to him or take down notes on what he had to say. He also would be carried through Rome on a chair, reading as he went, at one point going as far as to criticize his nephew for wasting so much time by walking around himself. The many errors of the encyclopedia often stemmed from Pliny taking the words of his sources as the absolute truth, leading to the inclusion of things like unicorns in the zoology section, as well as other animals that could simply kill a man by just looking at him. The copies of the encyclopedia would make their way throughout the centuries, being copied by monks throughout the 8th century, and having a resurgence in popularity in the Middle Ages, becoming one of the earliest books to be printed in the 15th century after the printing press was created. While in ancient society it was important as a source of science and nature, today it's seen as far more valuable for its details concerning artifacts, artwork, and architecture that no longer exist. In the end, Pliny wouldn't live long after the completion of his 37-book magnum opus, publishing it to the world in 77 AD. But in 79 AD, he led an expedition toward Mount Vesuvius as it erupted. He hoped to record the eruption and save anyone he could. However, as someone who suffered from a chronic respiratory condition, his nephew would write that he perished due to the toxic gases that spewed from the volcano. After learning of his uncle's death, Pliny the Younger would write, the fortunate man, in my opinion, is he to whom the gods have granted the power either to do something which is worth recording, or to write what is worth reading. And most fortunate of all is the man who can do both. Such a man was my uncle. Thank you for watching Learn Something New. If you like this video, please consider liking and subscribing to the channel. Also, if you want to help support the channel further as I make these videos, I now have a Patreon. Anything that you can afford to give would help me continue to make this channel better with each and every video. You can find the link in the description. Thanks again, and I'll see you in the next one.